We actually have a little surprise the President to meet us. This is courtesy of the Church Historical Department. In 1985, the Church did its very first Young Women's Broadcast, and it was trying to emphasize the global nature of the Church, and they had a beautiful young Filipina convert who appeared as the star of this video and delivered the first Young Women's theme. So get ready for the next two minutes and then we'll turn it over to Esther. to endure to the end, 
I don't believe that we are to endure in brittleness and rigidity because we are experts who already know everything. I believe we are to endure based on the Buddhist concept of a beginner's mind. In the words of Zen master Shunyu Suzuki, and I quote, the mind of the beginner is empty, free of the habits of the expert, ready to accept, to doubt, and open to all the possibilities. It is the kind of mind which, which can see things as they are, which step by step and in a flash can realize the original nature of everything will school. In work, life, and faith, a beginner's mind works wonders. One is always journeying and learning. How can God teach us if we already know everything? How can we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, unless we have a beginner's mind? Always curious, open, and teachable. In the last couple of decades, I made a conscious effort to open my heart and my mind to the full spirituality of this world and to learn as much as I can from God's many colorful children walking this earth. In the beginning, of course, I spent the first 14 years of my life in a farming village and then in the slums of the Philippines, a very Catholic country. Everyone in the Philippines is religious, and in my neighborhood in particular, when you are subject to hunger, disease, rabid dogs, violent neighbors, and typhoons and hurricanes, it's very easy to have faith. You're always on your knees, praying to God, asking for help and protection. In addition to the Christian God, I also believed in spirits. Some were kind and others vengeful. My best friend's mother, for example, was taken by spirits on Kimaras Island, my mother's island, and saved from all the suffering caused by her philandering husband. On the cautionary side, there's a story of my Chinese uncle-in-law, Hun Sing, who liked to hunt in the forest, and one time he shot a pregnant monkey. As she died, her companion, tears falling down his face, cast a cursed look at Hun Sing. Human tragedy struck soon thereafter. The next morning, my uncle-in-law and his wife, Mama Ashon, sat down to breakfast, and suddenly, the back door to their house opened and in barged this wild boar that jumped on the table, stared Ponsing in the eyes, and then chomped down and ran back to the banyan tree, the haunted banyan tree in the back of the house. That evening, offended by this boar's audacity, Pon Singh took his gun and ran outside and shot at the forest where the boar had run. That night, his stomach began to hurt. Wretched, tortured, and sweating, he summoned his driver. They drove in the dark from the village to the city. A surgeon opened him up and discovered that his intestines were completely tangled up. They'd never seen this sort of thing. He died that very evening and everyone in the village knew what had killed him. You do not mess with the spirits of the forest. This is the village where all of this action occurred. The belief in spirits and things unseen is widespread. On a recent trip to Iceland, my family learned, are there any Icelandic people in this room? <laughs> my family learned that 50% of Icelandic people believe in the folk. These are elves and other hidden beings with gifts and powers. If you have experienced the wild and desolate beauty of Iceland, it's easy to believe that unseen creatures are lurking in the lava fields, in the waterfalls, the fjords, the hot springs, the glaciers and volcanoes. Icelandic creatures believe that you, the folk, are protectors of the environment. Some think that you can negotiate with them. Some say there were neutral spirits in the war in heaven. J.K. Rowling, who gave life to many magical creatures and spirits in the Harry Potter series, once said in a documentary that I watched that magic may be about, quote, trying to control what we know is uncontrollable, which is life, close quote. The deeper meaning to me personally of spirits and things unseen is that there is a universal hope that we are not alone. 
We hope that we can navigate what is indeed an uncontrollable and unpredictable world. And while some spirits might harm, we hope in those who could prove to be our angels. At age six, my religious life became more formal. Nuns from the Daughters of Charity found my family in the slums of Iloilo City and invited us to attend their school for free. I attended mass regularly, I prayed the rosary, I confessed to the priest without fail every single week, and learned of a God who was strict, fearsome, judgmental. As an aside, um, the Philippines is a place where mortification of the flesh is celebrated. So at Easter, you'll find many Filipinos who self-flagellate and actually get crucified. I embraced the rituals of my Catholic faith. I thought it was necessary to punish myself for my sins. So one time I tried praying while kneeling on hard beams and stretching my arms out and putting a book on the top of each palm. It wasn't a good experience. <laughs> one day, a beautiful young nun named Sister Susana in my Christian living class made a declaration about faith that struck my heart. She said, Astrid, it's all about seeing God in other people. You must see God in every person and treat them that way. Suddenly I saw... Suddenly I saw a different God whose face was in every person, happy or miserable or whatever they might be. LDS missionaries came into the picture soon thereafter and my older sister and I were second to last to convert to the church because we were beer-drinking children. <laughs> we, we did repent, finally. And this photo on the right, so this is me, this is on the beach where I was baptized. This photo on the right was taken just outside the LDS chapel in Makati, the business district of the Philippines. And you can see my face there, you know, how, how happy I am. It's full of hope, uh, full of striving as a young Latter-day Saint. And at that time, two things were really important to me. First, was the belief confirming what Sister Susanna had said. I and everyone around me was a child of God. God was in every person, and I could nurture my divine self by looking for the virtuous, the lovely, the good, and the praiseworthy. And the other belief that was important to me was that the purpose of my existence was happiness and not fear or punishment. Psychologist and philosopher William James, in his study of the varieties of religious experience, says that the desire for happiness is the central motivation for what people will do and what they are willing to endure. For a long time, I was quite satisfied with my state in life. I knew everything. I tried to set everybody straight, including the born-again Christians at my school. And I was happy to lecture others about faith. But you know, you age, life, unfolds, and suddenly I found myself in a, in a position where my faith felt very wobbly. And I began to hunger for a fuller understanding of how God manifested his love for all his children. Billions of them with highly diverse belief systems that were different from mine, yet which I surmise must hold true and valid in the necessarily subjective worlds that people live in. I resolved my open, to open my mind to truths that others experienced in which I didn't know. Starting with scripture, I began to read the sacred writings of other faiths. In the DNC section 68, we read that scripture is the mind of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the will of the Lord, and the power of God unto salvation. What is the voice of the Lord and the will of the Lord to others not of my faith? I found Buddhist and Hindu texts particularly resonant. I was lucky enough to stumble upon my first Buddhist-based text in 2005 in a bookstore in Hong Kong, and that is Matthew Ricard's Happiness. Ricard comes from a very highly intellectual French family, and you know how, how snobbish French intellectual can be. <laughs> his father was a philosopher and his mother an artist and he had a PhD in cell genetics. So I was puzzled, why would he give up all of that to work at the Louis Pasteur Institute 
Why would he do all of that and turn his life to the great spiritual teachers of Asia? He did it because he had found a pearl of great price, a way to train his habits of mind so that peace and happiness became his constant state. Thus began for me many years of reading and thinking about Buddhism, focusing in particular on the writings of the great Vietnamese Zen master, Thich Nhat Hanh, and learning to, trying to learn mindful breathing and other meditative practices. From Buddhism, I've come to appreciate the central proposition that life's problem is not sin, but suffering. We suffer because we cling to false notions. We believe that things are or ought to be permanent, and when in reality, everything is change. Everything is just passing. I'm not even the same person that started this talk a few minutes ago. I've already changed. We suffer because we don't understand deeply that happiness and suffering are two sides of the same coin. In the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, no mud, no lotus. Put differently by psychologist Carl Jung, quote, even a happy life cannot be without a measure of darkness. And the word happy would lose its meaning if it were not balanced by sadness. It is far better to take things as they come along with patience and equanimity. And of course, in the Book of Mormon, for it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. Reflecting on the centrality of, centrality of suffering has made me a little more compassionate and a little less judgmental. I remember a former boss who was so difficult to work with. We all know that, right? Except that BYU, your president, is really nice. <laughs> During severely taxing moments, I would look at my boss and say to myself, he too is suffering. And almost immediately, a small surge of kindness would arise in my heart. Buddhist teachings tell us that the true way to transform suffering, our own and others, is through loving kindness and compassion. I am reminded that no one did this better than Christ, who showed us the ultimate way to live, absorbing all human suffering in himself, transforming all of it through love, and enabling all of us to find a permanent inner peace and serenity. From Buddhism, I've also learned about mindfulness or the practice of being fully present in the moment. The mind's default is to be busy. Often we are not where our bodies are. We are thinking about the past or the future. We are absent from the here and now. We're multitasking, we're multi-thinking, we're multi-social media. How do we bring ourselves to the present moment? We practice through meditation. Just like a muscle, we can train the mind to be like water underneath the ocean. Waves may churn on the surface, but the ultimate reality is just it's water underneath. Or like this cloud or the sky where clouds may come and go, but at the end of the day, the sky is there. It's always there. And we need to be anchored in what is called conscious breathing. Thich Nhat Hanh says, breath is the bridge which connects life to consciousness, which unites your body to your thoughts. Meditation is largely aspirational for me because I'm so busy. But there was a time when I meditated regularly. One evening, breathing in and breathing out. I would do that for 40 minutes. I meditated on three words, calming, stopping, centering. And I began to weep, realizing that I didn't know how to calm myself or stop myself from frenetic activity or center and focus my attention. I had been harsh on myself most of my life, unforgiving when I wasn't killing myself with work, and meeting crazy standards of perfection. I had not learned to love or care for myself in the way that I should, and how was I ever to learn to love and care for others if I didn't know how to do that? I also had 11 years of Kung Fu training in Manhattan. This is my original C4 master, Lawrence Tan. Kung Fu is very much based on mindfulness and the idea of perfection. As a Zen poem states, when you are standing, stand, when you are sitting, sit, and most of all, don't wobble. When you practice Kung Fu, you need to know your stances perfectly. 
Your fingers need to be where they need to be. You have to be in the moment. And what does this have to do with faith? In my religion, love is the supreme principle. And I and others fail at this because we don't know how to be perfectly present. In his book, No Death, No Fear, Thich Nhat Hanh says, when you love someone, the best thing you can offer is your presence. How can you love if you are not there? Most of the time, I feel the need to repent of my lack of mindfulness. Members of my cabinet are here tonight. They probably experience when I'm not really there in front of them. But when I'm not there for my spouse, my children, or my colleagues at work, my ability to love and listen are seriously hampered. Mindfulness is critical to alleviating suffering. It is even taught in hospitals to expedite healing. Normally, when we suffer, we tend to hold it all inside. We have not trained our minds to with our suffering, our dark and difficult feelings, and simply embrace them, acknowledge them, cradle them in our arms as we would cradle a child, and let them go and transform them into a different kind of energy. I believe that Christ was a Zen master. He taught us to know how to be and how to be present. He asked us to pay attention to the lilies of the field and the fowls of the air, who know simply how to live. They are resplendent as they are. He counseled us to take, to take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Yes, we need to recognize the past and plan for the future, but none of that would be much good if we're not even present in the here and now, if we are not inhabiting our bodies as we interact with one another. In teaching people how to pray, Christ said, Give us this day our daily bread. Notice that he said, this day, and then he said again, daily. Here, now. What are the blessings in front of us? Who is sitting to our right and left tonight? Are we not breathing without pain right now? Isn't everything a miracle? Temples. Humans have been known throughout history to build sanctuaries and shrines for prayer, worship, and sacrifice. And I've always admired major faith edifices. I lived in New York for 14 years, St. Patrick's, the Central Synagogue, and Lexington Avenue, and then of course, while living in Asia, uh, serene temples in Kyoto, and then in Hong Kong, the Big Buddha on Lantau Island. When my family lived in Hong Kong, we made many trips to the Big Buddha, a stone statue, a bronze statue weighing 250 tons, and you have to walk 268 steps to get to the top, and you're rewarded with a spectacular view of Hong Kong. Nearby was Poland Monastery where my family would get food. While I liked the Big Buddha and other over-the-top temples in Hong Kong, my favorite temple was actually a tiny one just below the apartment where my family lived. It was stopped in a little street, and I observed regular citizens stop by this temple daily to offer their hopes and their prayers. And I would join them, lighting an incense stick for my own hopes and my own prayers. Perhaps the most temple-going people I know are the Balinese. Bali is a Hindu island in Muslim majority in Indonesia. My family loves this temple, Tana Lot, and the name means earth and sea. The temple embodies the balance between the two. Balance is indeed critical for survival on a volcanic island like Bali. The last time we visited Tana Lot, we witnessed Balinese from all over the island coming to worship on the sacred day of Kunina, a day of intro introspection and reflection when the Balinese believed that their ancestors had been visiting them for three days, and on this day, all the ancestors are going back to heaven. The Balinese are hyper-aware of their ancestors, much like Latter-day Saints. The woman in green here is my family's friend, Wayan, and she's with her mother, her husband, and her sons. We have known Wayan for many years. She has introduced us to many Balinese ceremonies. And like most Balinese, she and her husband get up every morning, they tuck a flower in their ear, they leave a little basket, fill it with flowers, and offer it to, their, to, to God in their, in their family temple. The last time we visited Wayan, she took us to the baby blessing of one of her relatives. This blessing is known as Tiga Bunan or Nia Bhutan. It takes place at the end of three months. In the first three months of life, 
babies are considered very sacred, and so they're not ever allowed to touch the ground. But in this ceremony, the baby is welcomed into earthly life, and her feet allowed to touch earth for the first time. Her spirit is purified, and her body is blessed with strength. She is given sibling spirits to guide her on the journey to adulthood. The priest also blesses the parents, and they hold the baby, and they walk three times around holy water, and the three times as a symbol for birth, life, and death. This ceremony felt familiar to me, having attended many baby blessings, and having had my own children blessed and given a name. Our deepest hopes and prayers for our children and our supplication to God on their behalf is a common human trait. Well, that's the baby. Sorry, you want to see that cute baby again? <laughs> She's very well fed. <laughs> Luang Pabang in Laos is another sublime area for temples. Some of you may know the tragic history of Laos during the Cold War. It is the most bombed country in the world per capita. And today, people in Laos are still dying from unexploded ordnance. And yet, Laotians do have a lotus rising from the mud. Luang Pabang is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its gorgeous and exquisite temples that have survived war, chaos, and human brutality. One of the most moving sights you'll see is young monks going out in the dark each morning with their begging bowls. One of my fellow parents at Hong Kong Air National School wrote this about the ritual, and I'll share it with you. Quote, My wife and I were treated each morning by the 4 a.m. loud gonging of the temple bells heard throughout the town as the signal for the break of day. Soon after, we were honored to witness and participate in the daily ritual of the passing monks through the streets of this sleepy town, each carrying their colorful aunt's bowl in full, humble confidence that their simple daily needs would be met by the hundreds of townspeople lining the paths, offering small clumps of sticky rice, banana leaf wrapped vegetables, or even packaged rice cakes. This beautiful silent procession, similar to a giant orange caterpillar, weaving through the pre-dawn streets of Luang Pabang was one of the most moving experiences I have ever witnessed, close quote. The monk's act of begging reminds me of one of the most powerful sermons from King Benjamin in the Book of Mosiah and the Book of Mormon, who urged us to give and share without judging the petitioner because, quote, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being even God, for all the substance which we have." Close quote. The monks remind me further that Zion, this community of peace, is only possible as in Fort Nephi when, quote, people had all things in common, they were not rich and poor, and there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of people, close quote. When we truly make ourselves responsible for one another, through community and well-being follow. One final thought on temples is from the poet Khalil Gibran, from his book, The Prophet. These lines are true and profound to me. Your daily life is your temple and your religion. Whenever you enter into it, take with you your all. Take the plow and the forge and the mallet and the lute. And take with you all men. For in adoration, you cannot fly higher than their hopes or humble yourself lower than their despair. And if you would know God, be not therefore a solver of riddles. Rather, look about you, and you shall see him playing with your children. And look into space, you shall see him walking in the cloud, outstretching his arms in the lightning and descending in the rain. You shall see him smiling in flowers, then rising and waving his hands. Worship. Related to temples is worship, which I define as devotion to something bigger than self. In the LDS Articles of Faith, we affirm the privilege of worshiping how, where, or what we name. I have been inspired by the many ways people worship God. This is, an, this is an Episcopalian service in the Church of the Woods in New Hampshire. 
where believers worship on a hundred acres of wild lands and wetland. Their mission is, quote, to renew a widespread understanding of the natural world as sacred and to restore this awareness of the natural world and to restore this awareness as a foundation of both religious practice and practical action. They describe church as, quote, a place where the earth itself, rather than a building, is the bearer of sacredness. A place where people gather for contemplative practice in communion with each other and nature. My friend, the Reverend Stephen Blackmer, founded the Church of the Woods. For many years, he was a highly effective and recognized leader in conservation and environmentalism. He was fully agnostic about God. Then God, quite literally, called to him, showing him signs, wonders, and visions. He experienced great anxiety and depression. While on a flight to Dublin in 2007, he heard a voice, you are to be a priest. So a year later, he got baptized, and four years later, he finished divinity school. It was only when he arrived at Yale's Divinity School that he finally read the Bible. He was struck at how many times the Psalms mentioned trees. For example, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Even more moving to this new convert to Christ was the discovery that when Christ wanted to pray, he went to the countryside, the wilderness, the mountain, the deserted places, the garden, the lake shore. So many encounters with the divine happen in nature. Some of my own best moments of spiritual clarity have been in nature, including walking barefoot on a random patch of grass. Worship can happen when we are in tune with the glorious and fragile earth that we have been given. That's my son, Leo, not a Balinese kid. <laughs> Back to Bali, I have learned that silence is another powerful form of worship. Every year, the Balinese celebrate Nyepi just before their, their Balinese New Year. It's a day of complete silence, devoted to reflection, fasting, and meditation. People don't work or travel. This idea is similar to the Christian Sabbath, but it is a lot more intense. How profound silence is as a form of worship. When we bridle our tongue, we remember just how powerful speech can be both to build and to destroy. As Proverbs declares, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Music, as we know, is also a stirring way to worship. I once attended the funeral of my friend's father in a Sikh temple in Singapore, and I found myself mesmerized by Sikh music and the poetic lyrics that went with it. I have since learned more about Sikhism. Their founder, the prophet Guru Nanak, was born in what was then India, the present-day Punjab, in Pakistan, in the 15th century. At age 13, he refused to accept a thread in a Hindu ceremony that would have inducted them, him, into a higher caste. He fought the caste system that said only people of high status could know God. He also tried to bridge the gap between Hinduism and Islam. His calling began when he went to a river to bathe, but he did come out again for three days. And some thought that he had drowned, but he emerged having communed with God. He spent his life teaching at Onkar, one God, throughout Asia, and instituted communal eating where people of all castes and could come together to share a meal. My husband knows how obsessed I am with the song, Ek Onkar, which I could listen to over and over for one hour. It's only a one minute song, but I listened to it for one hour. So um, the words of his song, they're there. There's one God, truth is his name, is the creator without fear, without hate, and so on. These are the beginning lines of the whole mantra or the sacred scripture of Sikhs. And so I want you to close your eyes and listen to this song.
have ever worshipped for ecstatic dancing. I learned this from my daughter. Before COVID, we actually went to the uh, Krishna temple in Salt Lake City, and you can dance for two hours and you're not allowed to talk. So this is a ritual that I use for worshiping when the spirit strikes. And here's what Jeremiah had to say. Jeremiah 31. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the, the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. One of the biggest compliments that people pay me at UVU is to call me the dancing queen. <laughs> Goddesses, one of the things I have loved about my LDS faith is the teaching that we have a mother in heaven. And in my journey, journeys, I have paid attention to female deities that animate believers uh, feelings of divine love and care. As a child, my Catholic faith was imbued with love for Mary, the mother of Christ. Over the years, I have come to appreciate her more. She was a young woman in a patriarchal society who knew that she was going to be ostracized and shamed because of an unpredicted pregnancy. But she believed the angel who said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. In what we call the Magnificat as I was growing up, I found Mary's praise from the Lord powerful. With God, nothing shall be impossible. I love her transformation from fearful girl to confident seer when she said, Henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. What she was about to do would change the world forever, and she knew it. This is the temple of Saraswati in Ubud, Bali. Saraswati is the goddess of learning, wisdom, and knowledge. I actually found this statue in a store in Bali just before I became UVU president, and I saw the green hair, and I said, lady, you're going to go to Utah with me. And so she sits behind my desk at the office. In her hands, she holds four things, a book to symbolize learning, beads for prayer, a string instrument for music and the arts, and a lotus for purity and compassion. She rides on a swan, and the story goes that when this swan is given a mixture of water and milk, the swan can drink only the water, only the milk, sorry, as a symbol of discernment, discerning between good and evil, discerning between the just and the unjust. When I go to work every day, Goddess Saraswati reminds me of some of the best elements and values that should be informed practice and culture at a university. And just outside my house in Hong Kong, in a beautiful neighborhood sandwiched between the beach and the mountains, is the statue to the goddess of mercy, Wan Yin. Her name means, she perceives the sounds of the world, or one who hears prayers. Guan Yin is seen as a bodhisattva, a holy person, who was given the chance to leave the suffering of earth completely but when she heard the cries of humanity, she chose to come back to Earth. In Hong Kong, she is revered as a helper to sailors and fishermen, whose lives very much depend on mercy from the uncontrollable elements of wind, sea, and storm. Prayer is the pillar of my faith, and I am thankful that I have learned many ways to pray. In the Book of Mormon, I love the prayer of Enos. He was hunting in the forest and remembered his father's words. He said his soul hungered, and he cried to God in mighty prayer all day and into the night. He prayed for himself, then he prayed for his tribe, then he prayed for their enemies. Enos records that he poured out, quote, his whole soul in prayer. Praying with such intensity and energy is something that we should all experience. If you travel to the Himalayas, you will see these pair of flags. And these ones were on top of Monkey Temple in Kathmandu, in Nepal. These flags are arranged by color, blue, white, red, green, and yellow, signifying the five elements of sky, air, fire, water, and earth. They all have mantras or prayers on them, 
And as they flapped in the breeze, the faithful believed that blessings of compassion, goodwill, balance, and harmony spread. They dispel negative energy. The more prayer flags, the better. My daughter, who lives in Asheville, North Carolina, has been a teacher of prayer to me. A few years ago, she embarked on Vipassana, meditation while farming in the Philippines. Vipassana is 10 days of complete silence. And I asked her to describe this experience to me. For this 10-day retreat, these are my daughter's words, I met up with a group of other locals and travelers in Manila, and we rode buses and vans out to a small retreat center. We spent the first three days sitting for 10 hours a day, focusing exclusively on the breath. We soon found that limiting attention to just the breath is nearly impossible. Our minds would wander to thoughts about the past and future, incessantly spewing out thoughts. Our bodies would cramp up and send shooting pain to our, to our limbs. And still we had to sit with our eyes closed, no talking aloud. For the next few days, we practiced the full practice of Vipassana, where we were instructed to notice not just the breath, but also to scan our attention throughout our bodies and become sensitive to the subtle sensations there. The discomfort and difficulty to concentrate continued, but at this point, I felt more able to focus without drifting and to observe sensations without judging them as good or bad, and to recognize that peace is found in the space of accepting things as they are in the moment. The last couple of days, we practiced metta, or loving-kindness meditation. My body was feeling cramped and sore from sitting all day, but at the same time, I felt light and free, comfortable with my discomfort. On the last day, a line of ants, a line of ants, <laughs> started to crawl up my body, and I spent a good hour sitting with a feeling of continuous ant bites on my belly. The pain and discomfort turned into, this is not torture, this is meditation. <laughs> <laughs> the pain and discomfort turned into, a, into neutral sensations, not something that I had to change or run away from. In the afternoon of that last day, we had a spell of rain, the first after a long period of drought. As I stood under the falling water, I felt a deep sense of connection to all the rest of being. When I think about Vipassana meditation, experiencing reality as it is, and feeling, feeling oneself with compassion, I think of Christ in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. When we learn how to focus and train and calm the mind, blessings flow. Research shows how meditation, which to me is a form of prayer, can relieve anxiety, pain, and depression, it can even have the same effect as antidepressants. One of my favorite prayers is the five remembrances that I learned from Thich Tan. I say these remembrances every day. I am of the nature to get old, someday I will get old. I am of the nature to get sick, someday I will get sick. I am of the nature to die, someday I will die. Everything and everyone that I love is of the nature to change. Someday I will lose everything and everyone that I love. When I die, the only thing that I will take with me is my actions of mind, speech, and body. And I like this prayer because it keeps me humble. It moves me away from the temptation of the Ram Yamtam prayer, where I might celebrate my own awesomeness too much. Although you students at UV, you know how awesome I am. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I can be humble, there is hope for salvation. Prayer need not be anything we say. In some instances, it can simply be the ability to feel all in the presence of mystery and the sacred. And the sacred. Again, in Iceland, my family had the opportunity to see a part of this giant glacier, Vatna Yogurt. And my children and I had the chance to hold a piece of ice that's over a thousand years old. In 200 years, this glacier will be totally gone. As we stood on the boat, on the boat with this piece of ice, I felt something very sacred. It made me think of my behaviors that, that did not reflect the holy connection that I should feel with the earth on which I rely for my own life. 
It made me think of the mystery of my own relative insignificance. It made me think of the sanctity and fragility of life. When my son Whitman was here and I saw the Northern Lights in Finland in 2018, I felt the same awe and reverence for the sacred. These green dancing lights in the sky result when energy and particles from the sun mix with gases in our own atmosphere. There had been a sunstorm the week before we arrived, so everything was perfect for us to see auroras three nights in a row. These lights don't stay long at all. They change very quickly. They reminded me of how life itself is like this. Something or someone is there, and then they're not. Sometimes we don't focus enough to see with all what is before us or with us. Good health, a friend, a job, a spouse, children still young enough to adore us. They grow up and they don't like us anymore. <laughs> like the dancing lights in the sky, they're gone. Just as there is a sacredness to the majestic elements of nature, so there is sanctity and mystery in the daily blessings that we might be taking for granted. Finally, compassion and mercy. The great traditions that I have studied focus on compassion. And I learned one of my greatest lessons from a Muslim friend and brother, Dato Ibrahim Paglas III, otherwise known as Toto to his friends. Toto was the most successful Muslim businessman in the Philippines, and I met him when I was working on peace negotiations between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. He was a young mayor over a municipality that suffered so deeply from random and organized violence. He lost his father and little brother when a bomb was lobbed into their home. He talked to me about having an epiphany from Allah who told him to choose between more of the same, revenge, or to do something completely different. He chose not to avenge his family's losses. Instead, he found a way to create peace by giving people's jobs. He pledged his life as collateral to an American investor who was so moved that he put millions in Muslim lands to create a plantation. The plantation at one point was Chiquita Banana's second most productive plantation. Toto employed rebels, insurgents, kidnappers, uh, formerly incarcerated people, and regular citizens. Muslims and Christians worked together at the farm. He gave them training and assured their safety. On weekends, he asked all the Muslims to read the Bible, and he asked all the Christians to read the Quran, so that they would have an appreciation for one another's faith. He prohibited firearms at the farm and at the processing plant. People restored their dignity through work. A predictable schedule and income helped employees restore normalcy in their very difficult lives. Within a few years, violent incidents plummeted to zero. The plantation became a case study of building peace through economic development. And Toto always liked to say, you know, there are, there are, there is only one God, but he goes by different names. The glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. And Enoch bore record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain on the mountains? In my journeyings and exploration of faith, I have often found myself returning to these words of scripture that I have loved since I was a child. God wants us to seek light and truth. He asks us to sacrifice pride and love our enemies. We are to remember that the sun and the rain fall on everyone, and we are not to judge. We are only to love others. God weeps because the suffering of his children is real. Paraphrasing T.S. Eliot, the end of my faith journey and exploring has been to see my own faith in a new light over and over again. I have come to define foundational truths for me 
as those that I see taught, explored, and lived by others who are not of my faith, but who are God's children. I rejoice in the proposition that God's truth is one. Everywhere is the light of God. Christ said, if you are not one, you are not mine. And I take this to mean that we need to seek for and connect the threads of intelligence that unite us. My experience tells me there is a God who connects with all his children, and therefore I too must connect with God, his creation, the earth, and the human community. My faith is tethered to the idea that I know very little, and I have been taught by experience that life is less black and white and more gray. In the spirit of not knowing or understanding everything, I can work hardest on training my heart to be more compassionate. After all, my own faith teaches that charity never faileth. I am prepared daily to stand in awe in the presence of mystery and the sacred, and to find mystery and the sacred in things I encounter every day. The face of my child, the smell of grass, the oxygen that I breathe. No matter the turmoil inside or outside of myself, I know there is a peace that passeth understanding. Rooted in the gospel of a God who came to earth and suffered all, that he might know how to suffer his people. I will get old, I will get sick, and I will die, but all is well, all is well, because I know I am eternal. Birth and death are only concepts. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence was not created or made, neither indeed can be, DNC 63. I end with a message of hope, in Psalms 46 and DNC 101, we read the phrase, Be still and know that I am God. I like how somebody distilled this phrase into one word, be. Wherever we go in each of our faith journeys, there we are. We need to know simply how to be. In every moment and every circumstance, in every human interaction and shared experience, if we pay close attention, we can find the virtuous, the lovely, and the truthful. We can touch God. We can find love. It is abundant, and it is enough. Thank you very much, and God bless us all. cartoons and at the end they have a little saying that's all folks <laughs>